I'll start off with my education, I think. Uh, I went to Western State College where I met my wife back there. We were both studying education. I wanted to be an art teacher to begin with. Uh, I also got a degree in graphic design because I thought, well, if I, the teaching thing doesn't work out, then I'll go into graphic design, and, and that's what I did. Um, student taught at Doherty and realized I didn't want to teach at the time. Um, there's plenty of stories there, too. Um, but uh, so I got out of school. I went, to, I went into graphic design and worked for a sign company for five years and did a lot of graphic design, did some airbrush illustration on Harleys, did some landscapes for people, did uh, logo design. It was one of my favorite jobs that I've ever had. Um, I realized that the, the job was could very well kill me because the shop I worked in, we didn't have ventilation. I was breathing in leaded paint half the time. And um, so I looked into graduate school and decided to go back to graduate school. Got into University of Oregon for the program of interior architecture and design. And so we moved up to Oregon and uh, I got a degree of interior architecture. And since then, I've been working in uh, architecture. And since we've been back in the Springs for 15 years, I've worked for RTA Architects just down the street, doing large commercial, healthcare, retail, schools, um, anything we can get. So um, it's a good place. I enjoy it. And I enjoy everybody here that's, that's from there. And I'm glad to see Mitchell made it because he does need some culture. So I'm, I'm glad he's here with his wife. So Hopefully we can we can offer some some good culture. Um, so knowing that um, when we moved back here to the Springs, um, this was 15 years ago. A couple of years after that, my family and I were up in Boulder, walking around, looking for a restaurant, looking in galleries, and I walked past this window, and I'd always done artwork on the side. I love all different mediums, tried all different mediums, and kept everything because I didn't want to give it away. Didn't think I could sell it anywhere, so it just hung on my wall. So we're walking past this gallery one day with my kids and my wife, and I looked in at the artwork and looked at the prices, and I thought, I can do that. <laughs> I should be doing that. Um, let's see if we can do that. So um, I started thinking about, well, what types of artwork do I want to spend time doing because I, I feel really strongly about, um, I'm going to digress a little bit here, but in architecture school, we learned about um, these craftsmen in the early 1900s that created these beautiful structures. They, they mastered their craft. They mastered their tools. They knew how to create things that were amazing. Um, in the last several years, I've, I've noticed that a lot of our craftsmen um, don't know their tools. They can't, they can't go beyond just seeing what's on paper and, and making what it looks like there. They, everything's up to somebody to design it for them, and then they go build it. It used to be you'd give an intent, you'd draw out some drawings, you'd give it to the craftsmen, and they would make it come alive. Um, you know, the craftsman movement, the... Art Deco, Art Nouveau, it's about the craftsmen who, who um, had things in their heads and they could use their tools to create those elements. So going back to walking through Boulder, I thought, well, <coughs> I want to start painting, um, but I got to figure out, I got to master some sort of medium. I got to figure this out. So I wanted to work big. I'd wor worked in a sign company. I love working big. Um, like Rachel mentioned, she used to work at creating things that were hyper realist or trying to capture an image that looked real. And I, I used to do that too. And it just it wears on you after a while. It's just like, all right, I gotta do snack, relax. Have another drink of beer. Um, so I thought, okay, so if I'm going to work big, I can't afford Liquitex. I can't go to the art store and spend $10,000 to cover one canvas of 
paint. So I went to the Ace Hardware and started looking through the paints that they had there and um, tried different brands. I tried Regal, I tried Sherwin-Williams, I tried all these different brands. And working in architecture at the same time, I was aware of Benjamin Moore and, and all these different paints. And so Ace happened to carry Benjamin Moore and I started painting with that. I made mistakes. I learned how the paint runs. I learned, um, you know, how to control it. Uh, I, I started squeezing it through um, ketchup bottles um, with the thought of, I like this gentleman named Jackson Pollock's style. I think a lot of people have grabbed just scrap paint and just splattered and poured it just to get the feel out of their system just because it looks like fun. And it was, you know, I did, I did that and I thought, well, this looks like Jackson Pollock. Uh, not quite Jackson Pollock, but um, I got it out of my system and I didn't want to keep going with that because it's, it's been done. Um, but also I learned in, in architecture school that I was told by uh, my history teacher that there is nothing new out there. You know, you're just getting influenced by all these other architects out there and you you take these pieces and you put them together. And at first I was offended by that. I was like, no, we can create something new. This, this is, we can do that. And the more I thought about it, the more I got into it, I'm playing with this paint. Um, I had to look at some other artists. It's really about mastering, mastering that medium and making it do what you want it to do. Um, and taking influences from different, different artists that you like and trying to come up with something new. So um, looking for a different way to apply this paint, I wanted to work flat. I wanted it to drizzle over the edges like you see on the, on the sides of these paintings. I wanted that element to give some more dimension to the pieces. Um, at first I was trying to push the paint out of, a, out of a squeeze bottle or something, but I had way too much pressure. I thought, okay, so we need to pour it. So how do I, for it, but I want some. I want some order. A friend of mine once said, "Well, your paintings look like your Jackson Pollock with OCD." <laughs> you know, because some of them were getting a little too myopic in, in detail and, and everything. So again, I had to back up, and loosen up a little bit more. Um, so I ended up coming up. We've got two cats, and um, I thought, well, what if I what if I pour it out of a cat food can? I can. I can just work it with a little bit at a time. I'm not holding a gallon jug or a quart can. It's too heavy. But maybe I'll use a cat food can and, and pour it out. So I started pouring it, and I did a few paintings like that. And then I thought, no, I need I need some more uh, some more control. Um, I'm not a control freak because I want the paint to do its thing too, but I needed a little bit more control out of the out of the paint can. So I got out my drill. And another thing about this too is, is while I'm thinking along these lines, I'm always going to the hardware store, Home Depot or Lowe's or Ace Hardware and just walk in the aisles thinking, okay, what can I use here? I was looking at strainers. Well, if I pour it out of a strainer, it's coming out of 50 holes at once. That's too much paint. I can't make an image with that much paint coming out. Um, so I, this can's been used. It's got paint in it, but um, these are hole punch and a drill, and I pour the paint out of the hole in the bottom of the can. Um, this can, can adjust the, the size of the hole. At a microscopic level, you can just push it in there. It's aluminum, so it gets bigger, you got more paint coming out. Um, so I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And for the last 10 years, that's what I've been painting with. And um, so then I did a lot of paintings with just lines and working with texture, they look like weavings. And I thought, well, now what about making something that's representational? Uh, how do we go about that? And so uh, I thought back to my days of doing the air airbrush illustration on Harleys and, and doing some signage and, and posters, um, more of the hyper-realism with, with the airbrush. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, so when I'm spraying with an airbrush, it's little tiny, tiny droplets of paint being forced against your surface. 
and you get these masking surfaces that retain that pigment in one certain area. Um, and I thought, okay, um, can't throw the paint at the canvas. And I don't know how many of you have seen the movie um, uh, where they swing the lady with the paint we were talking about the other day. Uh, what was it called? The bowling movie. Yeah, the, the big Lebowski. I just saw it for the first time. You know where they take the woman and she's got paint, paint brushes and they swing her across the room and she throws paint. Well, that's a little too random for me. That's a little more like Jackson Pollock. If he thought of that, I think he would have done that. Um, so I thought back to my airbrush days of using frisket paper, frisket film, cutting out the patterns, masking. And so I tried that a little bit. I drizzled the paint on there, and when I pulled the paint off or the tape off or the frisket, the paint had scooched underneath. So now you keep your lines very straight and clean. Um, but it'd gone underneath, and it was a little too too rigid for me. So I thought, well, okay, mm, let's figure out a different type of template. So I went out and I bought a sheet. I went to Home Depot. I bought a sheet of pink styrofoam insulation cardboard, half inch thick. And I took that home, I used my Dremel tool and I was cutting out my template. Because I each, let me back up, getting ahead of myself, I'm skipping all over. Um, each of the paintings, each color that I do is a separate template. Um, and then I divide my image into colors. This painting is I think 15 colors. And so each color on there has a separate template. And so I needed to find a material that didn't have a, a texture to it or a grain um, that I could cut easily with my hand with an exacto knife. That's where the pink insulation board came in. Um, again, if it sat on top of the surface, it sucked the paint under it. Capillary action, I don't know what that was called. Capillary action sucks the paint under the surface and it just it ruins it. So I thought, okay. I need to suspend my template over the surface, allow the paint to fall through, kind of spread out, and find its own its own place. So I um, then went to cutting it out of card cardboard. So this piece actually is comes off of this painting over here. I found it before. So you can see where the green showed up, where I painted through the template. As a template sat on the on the painting there, uh, a couple different greens on this painting, two different greens in, in those spots. Um, my secret tool is if you can see on the back, there's little push pins. Those are my standoffs from the sign world. We have standoffs that hold letters off the wall. I was thinking, well, we could do the same with little push pins. They only go through the first layer of cardboard, then they stop at the second layer. And then that sits on your on your surface and holds it up. Um, so at that point, I was getting carpal tunnel syndrome in my hands because I was cutting. Well, let's say this painting has twenty seven colors. I think uh, I'm cutting twenty seven templates by hand, either with a Dremel tool or a exacto knife. Um, I couldn't open my hand up at the end of the day. Just walk around like this. Um, so here's where Makerspace comes in. Drew's from the Makerspace. I met him there. He helped me out tremendously with a, a machine called the Laser CNC machine, which is amazing. Um, so now mastering my tools is what I was talking about earlier. So. I'm using imagery that I come up with. Either I'm taking the photographs, I'm combining photographs. Um, this picture was taken behind our cabin up in Canada. Uh, that picture is from a, uh, another cabin near Aspen, a log cabin. Um, so I take these images, adjust color, separate it into individual colors. I look at the image, I think, if I separate this into 15 colors, that'll be about right. 
Um, this one, 26, 27 will be about right. This one is 12, maybe. Um, and then I cut each template, and then I paint by hand. Each template's much more detailed than what comes out with paint as it goes through and spreads out. Um, very true. Some of the templates are actually from photographs, and so they're very detailed, but I don't want that. I want the paint to talk for itself. I want the viscosity, which which varies. You know, these are right out, this one's right out of a can. So semi-gloss, Benjamin Moore, um, comes out, it spreads out a certain distance before it hardens, starts to harden. It's a skin on it, and it stays. Uh, once it gets there, I can go to the next layer. And I want the next layer to overlap that, to give it a softer look. I want it to interact with itself. I want to, I want the medium to be uh, part of the creation. I don't want to control it completely. So I've found that, you know, as, as I'm bending over this, drizzling my paint through that little hole, I'm following most of that. Some of these holes, the paint bridges, it goes over, it won't even fall through there. But you have to be able to let, let that go, let that detail go, because it doesn't matter. Because once, once you're working on a big canvas, a big surface, a big image, uh, this is like pixelation in a photograph in a magazine, your mind connects the dots. And it, the observer will connect the dots and their mind will see a complete image, a more, more of a crisp image. Not always, but usually I start dark and I work the shadows and then I work to the highlights. Um, and then once, once I get through all the templates, I'll stand back, I'll set it up in my driveway, walk out in the cul-de-sac and just go, it's, it's not there. It's not, I don't have the definition. I don't have the, the um, contrast that I need. So then I'll go back in by hand and, and I'll hold Hold my beer and watch this. Um, I'll use this, a piece of it, and I'll zero in on a spot. I'll add a little bit more. I'll add a different color. You know, I'll work out here, come back, work out here, come back to kind of dial it in, add, add some of those shadows, those highlights, the, the push and pull of that, that image so that it, it reads better. Some paintings like that one have a grain to them. So, I've painted it all one direction, vertically. And so as I'm painting this, I don't want to outline each piece, right? Because then it looks like it's outlined on there. What I'll do is I'll start at one end and I'll go past it this way, I'll go past it this way. And as, as, it, as the paint comes along, it drops through, it goes and then it stops. And so if you keep it consistent, you end up with that grain, it's almost like a wood grain that runs through the whole painting. Um, with a painting like this, it's more about the shape of the holes in the template, which mimic the actual wood grain on the end of that log, on that log cabin, because when you cut a tree fresh, smooth, as it ages, as it weathers, the soft woods and everything start to peel away, the harder woods stay there. And so each of these little pieces is almost like a piece of hard, harder wood. It's projecting out, and as you get away from it, you can look at that, it's very dimensional. And so it all depends on what the outcome looks like. With this, with this painting here, um, I could have gone through and dripped, dripped aspen leaves in little droplets, little round leaves everywhere, but I wanted to capture some of the, the um, movement, the quaking, I call it quake, so it's the quaking motion that you get as as you dribble the paint over the template. I'm kind of quaking as I'm doing it. I've had a lot of coffee. And it <laughs> coffee helps paint aspen trees. A um, couple of things um, that I learned. I asked the question because I was thinking in my mind how, how I'd talk about it. But um, one painting in here in particular, this one here, um, I did learn something as I was as I was doing it. I, I started off with an image I liked, a composition I liked, a color combination. It's uh, complementary. Um, it's got great depth. Um, but as I was painting it, I, I ended up 
thinking more about it, and um, I called it age. And and so for a couple of reasons. So one is it's an old old log old log cabin, and um, the patina that that log's got is uh, shows its age. Um, but I I went through losing my father in June to dementia, and so for the fast six seven years um, we had watched his decline through um, the disease of, of dementia. So I got to thinking about the tree and how as it's young and it starts to grow, it builds these rings, which are memories of the seasons of its past. Um, it becomes solid, it becomes stronger as it gets bigger. Um, and then as it ages, it gets older, uh, some of those rings start to um, divide and they, you start losing the soft tissue in between. You start losing some of those memories that made up those rings to begin with. Um, and it's not as uh, consistent. It's not as continuous. Um, so it was, it was kind of fun. I enjoy diving into an image I, I like very much and then getting something more out of it by the time I'm done painting this image. Um, and for me now, it's, it's more about the process of just making. Once I'm done with it, yeah, I'll hang it on my wall for a while, and and we like it in our house. But there's not, we don't have a house big enough to keep paintings like this. Um, so I need to I need to move them on and and start new ones. I use my my nail punch sometimes. So if I if I drizzle some paint on and it didn't quite go where I wanted it to, these are all sitting flat. Um, I'll drizzle a little more paint and I'll I'll encourage it sometimes to move. Um, and then it still it still is drizzled, or I'll encourage it off the edge so it runs more off the edge. I want some of this color to wrap the edge. So I haven't used a brush in quite a while. If it goes too far, you can't just wipe it off because that paint gets into all the other crevices, and you see a shadow of it throughout. It's it's really hard to clean off the, the layer over the top of the other ones. Um, you either have to start over roll the whole canvas with a single color, which is what I did with that that one back there. That used to be a different painting. Um, and so that's why it's got such great texture under the black, because that was the base layer for this painting. Um, but it just really didn't sing to me. It didn't say it was done. We had it on the wall. It worked for a while. And, and I got a couple of good compliments. People liked it. But, um, it just didn't sit right with me. So I took it home. Rolled it with black, and I was like, "Look at that texture." That's why I did that painting. Um, and then I started again on top of that with a new image, which um, which I really like how that that one turned out. So, but then that taught me that I knew this painting was going to have a solid black background, and that was going to show through in some places. So it needed some texture to break that up. So. I painted black and then I painted a bunch of black on top of that um, with cans with four or five holes in them. And I was just going all over. It was like a like a spider web in the background there. Um, but it gives your eye something to, to look at, to explore in those dark recesses of that log. I've learned to ignore what's up close, but, I, but each of these is a different painting up close. You may look at part of this and go, well, I just love that composition right there. I could look at that. And then next time I come by, I, I like this. And, um, but it's the, the um, knowledge that if I work on these details up close, I let it dry. Like I said, I'll put it, I'll lean it up against the car in the driveway and go out in the, in the driveway to look at it and see where more detail needs to come in, then I have to come back in closer and add some more, some more to make those shadows and those those highlights come out. Um, but I like that about it. I like having it as two or three different paintings. So it's based off the image or the the design I want to work on. I've got a list at home of fifty paintings I'd like to do. Um, I go down the list and think, okay, oh this one. Yeah, I really want to do that one this time. And I'm excited about working on that one. So 
I'll either go out and take photographs to gather that, or I'll, um, um, or if it's abstract, I'll just start from scratch. I'll start drawing, or I'll start with, um, this is a bunch of images, and this is using my graphic design background, where I'm looking at composition, color, uh, transparency, movement, um, where I'm gathering a bunch of images, I'm overlapping them, I'm putting uh, transparencies on in like Photoshop, and I come up with an image that looks great digitally. I know it's gonna be different when I paint it, um, because now I'm, I'm applying the, the fine artist to it and painting it from, from this image that I created from scratch. So each template is the same size as the canvas for registration. Um, so each one lines up, you know, even if, even if there's just, you know, this little piece of blue here, you know, maybe that's all that's on that canvas. So I've got one template, it's got that cut out. I start with a plan, but we all know what that means. You know, it's nothing goes to, to plan, right? So you've got to be open to, oh, that didn't come out like I thought it would. And I don't see what I thought I'd see. Um, and that's part of the fun of the creation part is, is just to keep going, you know, and, and sometimes you do get to a point where it's just like, mm, it's not going to get there. And so you either tear the canvas off and put new canvas on and start over, or you get to a point and it's like, that's far enough. I need to back away and, and stop. Uh, I might not have gone as far as I thought I needed to, but, um, sometimes you gotta, you gotta stop early. You don't have to wait, but what happens is, is those two colors then blend and it becomes one layer. I prefer to let them dry so that you see that overlap. You get much more texture. You wait an hour or two so it gets a skin on it. Or you wait a day so it's hard. Um, and then it builds on top of it. I like more texture. So when the, when the sunlight's coming in through the window and you stand off to the side, you see all the highlights coming in through the window, it's kind of, kind of neat. Tape solves problems really easily. You tape over a section and no paint goes through there. Um, or you pull out your pocket knife and you cut, cut a bigger hole to allow paint to get through the areas that it didn't go through. And it's like, oh, I really needed that line to show up here, but it's too thin at this scale and at this viscosity of paint that it doesn't want to go through that point. So you got to make it wider. Um, I haven't, I haven't started completely over with a template. But. So when we're working at, at RTA every day, we're, we're creating things for other people. We're, we're solving these problems and we're making buildings, we're making, um, design for other people. But, um, there's something so satisfying about it for me that I need to do it on my own when I get home. Um, I'm not going to design buildings or houses because I can't afford to make those all the time. Um, outside of work. Uh, I'd love to do my own home someday, but um, this allows me to create that problem in my head, solve it, build it, complete it, and feel um, satisfied that I actually completed something. And, and I'm not waiting two or three years for a big building to get done and go to the ribbon cutting, which is extremely satisfying. But you've got to wait and wait and wait for that satisfaction. This I can do in a couple of weeks, and I've done it from beginning to end. Now, I got out of that what I wanted to get out of it. That's, that's a statement for me. It's, a, it's the, the process I went through, which I got enjoyment out of. Um, once I hang it on the wall, and once people start looking at it, it's up to them to see what they see in it. I can't stand here all the time waiting for people to come by and tell them what they need to see in that painting. Um, they're either going to like it or they're not. They're going to, some people come in um, and say, I, I love it. I understand it. That's, that's, this is what this means to me. And it could be off in left field from where I started. Uh, but it doesn't matter because I think that's what's important about it. Art is, is it's going to end up in somebody's home. And they're going to love it for their reasons. And that's, um, I've gotten out of it what I need, but part of that is also 
being able to create something that somebody else would get enjoyment out of on their terms as well. I don't know, I just, just like we have ideas on design of buildings and stuff, everything that we'd like to do someday, you know, sometimes we get a chance to do a really cool building that's got a budget that's astronomical, not very often, but um, once in a while you get to work on that. It reminds you of school where there were no budgets and you could design something really cool uh, using your talents that you've, you've learned. Um, but it's really, uh, I get ideas everywhere. Just walking down the street. This morning I got out of the car and there's this guy, he was just stepping out of the shadow of a building and he's got this big orange backpack on and he's a leaf blower. And he's blowing these leaves across the, the parking lot and all these big orange leaves come up in the air and like envelop this guy and I'm like, <laughs> It looked like that. And I was like, I need my camera. I need to go take a picture of this guy blowing his leaves across the parking lot and then go paint that. Because it was just, it was almost like, just handed to me. It's like, here you go, here's an opportunity. So those were using holes that were quart size. So it was right out of the quart can of paint. I was just pouring right out of the can. So I go from that to 8th or 16th inch holes out of my cat food cans. So there's a range in there. But that, yeah, that was right out of the can. And that's, those are more about, those five paintings are more about um, color theory and what people see right off. When, when you look at one of those paintings, what comes to mind? What comes out of your history, your past, that you connect with, with those colors? Um, you know, I titled them for what came to my mind right off, um, but maybe, hopefully that doesn't sway anybody on what they see in it. Um, you know, and, and that happens in other paintings. Some, somebody may not like a painting because it's, it's not the composition, it's not the layout, it's not anything about it other than maybe the colors have this connotation in their mind that it's something unpleasant or you know. Yeah, because sometimes I'll get all excited about something. I'll just go to town on it, start working on it, and two days later I'm like, eh, that's not what, that's not, I'm not excited about that like I was. And either I'll start over or, because um, that does, that happens. <laughs> if, if I'm frustrated, I leave at work when I leave. And then I come home and I have a, a Dale's Pale Ale, usually really helps. And then, um, I don't know what it is about Dale's, but there's something in it that helps with the artisticness. Um, but I also turn on music, and so music sways me one way or the other. I love music, and that's another thing is I get inspired by is music. Um, I'm not musical at all. I can't play an instrument or sing to save my life. So, um, but there's a connection between art and music. I'm not sure what it is or it's something tactile that I want the complexity of my paintings to match the complexity of the music I like. And so that helps with the mood. So if I play some good music, I sit back, just listen to that for a few minutes, get set up, it gets your blood flowing, get you in a different mindset, and then, um, and then the paint starts flowing better. Oh yeah, this one is eight feet long. So most of the ceilings in our house are at eight feet. So it's hard to stand a painting up and then get above it to paint your name on the edge of the, the canvas. So we do have a skylight in the kitchen. So I put it on end, put it in the corner, which held it up and then got on a ladder. And my wife got a good picture of me up there signing my name to the top of the, the painting in the skylight. So that's kind of fun. Yes. <laughs> yep. So, thanks for coming tonight.